communications at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's a renowned researcher into metaphor, particularly, and metonymy as well. And he had a, an impressive list of publications. Uh, which he authored on, or co-authored, for example, this guy, Psychology and Sociology of Literature, a Method of Linguistic Metaphor Identification, um, a Metaphor in, uh, in Cognitive Linguistics, and uh, recently, he uh, also co-edited uh, the Handbook of Pragmatics. So, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to listen to Professor Steen, who is going to also talk about the Deliberate method of theory, as you can see, uh, an interesting theory we also discussed uh, yesterday, but finally we'll find out what it's all about this morning. The floor is yours, Mr. Steve. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vladek. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I thank the organizers for inviting me and for all their wonderful help in getting me across. Um, I'm going to talk about the relation between metaphor and style this morning, uh, especially um, from the perspective of what is needed to do uh, reliable and valid research on that. So I'll be talking basically about the theoretical framework, about the methods that are needed, and I'll be reporting some uh, empirical work. Uh, all of this started 25 years ago when I defended my PhD, and then afterwards I realized it. What was needed was something more sophisticated and elaborate uh, for metaphor studies than what we have in conceptual metaphor theory, and I'm going to present you the, the results of that work here. So, um, the plan of the talk is as follows. I'll first of all talk about metaphor and language use from the perspective of conceptual metaphor theory, that's like for Johnson basically and their followers. Then we'll talk about metaphor and language use from um, the perspective of my own theory, which has uh, been growing over the past 10 years, and it's not just my own theory, there's also members of my group and people outside it that are working on it. Um, then I'm going to connect metaphor and language use to discourse, um, which I would emphatically want to distinguish from language use, and uh, I do that from the perspective of genre. And so what it says in italics there, basically I'll talk about communication at two levels of aggregation of expression or of meaning. So I, I think when you talk about uh, communication styles, we need to distinguish between these two levels, and I hope that that is one of the main points for today that we can take away and discuss. All of that is a theoretical framework, and then I'll try and become a little more concrete by talking about metaphor and register and style, and then metaphor and register and metric, and I'll draw a brief conclusion there. Okay, so um, I think that uh, the main conclusion that we can draw from the work of Lincoln from Johnson for uh, this conference is that metaphor is not just a stylistic device or a matter of style, but that instead it's a matter of all language use. And I think that everybody's kind of familiar with that um, assumption. That's a starting point for today. And the main inspiration of, of that is, of course, conceptual metaphor theory. And these are examples that most people will probably know. So, for instance, like for Johnson collected all sorts of examples of how English works and when it talks about abstract or difficult concepts, and they found that we need metaphors to do so. So, for instance, when we talk about theories, we say things like, is that the foundation for your theory? The theory needs more support. We need to construct a strong argument for that. We need to buttress the theory with solid arguments. The theory will stand or fall on the strength of that argument, and so far we put together only the framework of the theory. And they conclude that this systematic um, variation in language use, which takes us away from the language of theories to what they call the language of buildings, suggests that we think about theories as if they are buildings. Okay, And this is not just one fortuitous example. Here's another example when we talk about ideas. Um, which is closely related to theories, we don't talk about those as buildings, but we talk about them as if they are food. So, for instance, all this paper has in it are raw facts, half-baked ideas, and warm building theories. There are too many facts here for me to digest them all. I just can't swallow that claim. Let me stew over that for a while. That's food for thought. She devoured the book. Let's let that idea simmer on the back burner for a while. 
So here's the second set of examples. People probably know all this, and if they don't, then I think this gives you a, a flavor of how conceptual method of theory in cognitive linguistics works. The most famous one probably is love as a journey. When we talk about love, uh, and maybe more generally about life, we say things like, look how far we've come. We're at a crossroads. We'll just have to go our separate ways. We can't turn back now. I don't think this relationship is going anywhere. Where are we? We're stuck. It's been a long, bumpy road. This relationship is a dead end street, and we're just spinning our wheels. So, Lincoln Johnson built a case that um, our language is replete with metaphors. Um, they even contended that we live by metaphors and that we, we think we, we need metaphors for our thoughts to drive our actions and our relation um, with the world. And so what does that mean when we go beneath all of this language use? Um, they um, reconstructed what they call cross-domain mappings. And so um, it's not just in the language, it's in the thought. When we think about journey, sorry, about love, we need our knowledge of journeys to construct this elaborate cross-domain mapping. And so when we talk about the lovers, we talk about them as if and think about them as if they are travelers. When we talk about the love relationship itself, we think about it as if it's a vehicle. When we talk about the events and think about the events in the relationship, it's a journey. And the progress made in the relationship is the same or is compared to the distance covered. And when we think about difficulties we experience in a love relationship, they are as if they, they can be thought of in terms of the obstacles you encounter in your journey. And your choices about what to do in a love relationship can be thought about in terms of the decisions about which way to go in the journey. And finally, the goals of the relationship, which I find kind of a strange thing. In relation to our goal, but still. Um, that would be compared with the destination of the journey. So these are all examples that I took from Lake and Johnson, and um, this was uh, their book in 1980. Um, since then, Literally hundreds, if not thousands, of articles and books and PhD theses have been published in this particular framework, trying to work out the relations between um, metaphor and thought from this perspective of conceptual metaphor theory. The main claims, of course, of this perspective are metaphor in language is a reflection of metaphor in thought. This is the big change that Lakoff and Johnson uh, affected in their work. Before then, a metaphor was just something like a stylistic device, a formal device, something poets use, but not really something everybody uses in their thoughts and in their lives. Metaphor in thought, or conceptual metaphor, is conventional, it's ubiquitous, and it's the norm. It's not deviant, it's not um, always novel, and it's not seldom here and there. And metaphor in thought works automatically and unconsciously. We don't have to work out what it means when we say she devoured the book. So um, it drives our thought very, very fast. Metaphor and thought, therefore, helps us think about what's the function. It helps us think about abstract, complex phenomena in simpler, more familiar terms. Okay, these were, in 1980, these were really novel insights. Not really, really novel. If you go back into the tradition of uh, rhetoric and philosophy, there's been lots and lots of predecessors, but actually, against the state of the art in 1980, linguistics and cognitive science, these were the, this was a new um, point of departure. So um, I guess that this is kind of what everybody knows here, or should know, or can sort of assume as familiar. Um, I have a big problem with this theory. I don't think it's completely right. And that's the new um, message that I want to share with you here. Um, I think that some metaphor in language is different than most metaphor in language because it is used deliberately as a metaphor. Most of the examples that we just saw are not used as metaphors by the sender to the receiver. They don't ask the receiver to think of love as a journey or to think of theories as buildings. This is very different than, for instance, imagine you go to your doctor um, with uh, a serious illness, and the doctor says, don't think of your illness as a fight, think of it as a dance, or think of it as a journey. 
those would be the metaphors where you are deliberately invited to think about one thing in terms of something else. That's a very, very different kind of use of metaphor. It's, it's a metaphor all the same, and the other ones remain metaphors all the same. But something different is happening there. And that is the point I'd like to elaborate here. What I suggest is deliberate metaphor use makes people really think about one thing in terms of something else by means of a deliberate cross-domain comparison during Atlas comprehension. So when Shakespeare writes, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, you actually have to do the comparison online to get the point of that utterance. And if you don't do so, you don't get the message of that particular sentence, and you can't continue reading the sonnet. Okay, so you are doing online comparison, and you even have access to it introspectively. You know that you are, you may even have to work with it, take a little time to work out what does that mean, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So what, why would Shakespeare want to compare his beloved to a summer's day? And my claim is that this is not the case for most metaphor, which is the central phenomenon in conceptual metaphor. See, nobody, when I showed you the examples before, was going, ah, we think of love as if it's a journey when you just hear these sentences, like, look how far we've come. Nobody goes to space in order to think about love. Okay, not, you, you're not aware of that. You're not, you're not aware that you're accessing this source domain of travel. And to me, this is an important distinction. And that suggests that maybe, and if you become very radical about this, most metaphor might not be processed by cross-domain mapping. And therefore, most metaphor might not be processed metaphorically. And that produces a paradox of metaphor. Most metaphor is not metaphorical. Okay, so this is to me a very important point. If um, Lake von Johnson suggests that we live by metaphors and most metaphors don't work as metaphors, what do we live by? Okay, that's the, that's the problem that is raised here. In order to illustrate um, what is happening here, Illustrate this live. Here's a little film. Um, which I should show you the deliver better news. Was it was? Life is a symphony. Life is a cosmic So, this is deliberate metaphor use, and um, one of the interesting things is that I've been in a fight with one of my dearest friends, colleagues, over the past maybe five or six years, Ray Gibbs, who says deliberate metaphor doesn't exist, it, it's a, a vacuous idea, we've been having fights at conferences and journals, and I think that this little film should shut him up. Um, what we see happening here is the deliberate search for an appropriate alien source domain for a figurative comparison. Right? They are actually they have a format there, life is, and they are trying to find the right source domain. This clearly is not automatic at all. It is not unconscious, even though it is conventional. You know, life is a tunnel, it's kind of life is a journey, and, and people might even say this have said, said this themselves. Or, yeah. Deliberateness doesn't mean that it's novel. It can also be conventional. You are just looking for the right domain. You are thinking metaphorically. You are bringing up the source domain as a source domain. 
and can even lead to going, ah, I don't want the comparison here, I can't find the right comparison, I'm not going for left, or I'm going to do a different figure, life is life, here's tautology. Okay, so you can even give up the whole idea of trying to find the appropriate comparison. So, from my perspective, I think metaphor can be deliberately designed and received as a metaphor. And of course, that's good news for us, because that means that we, as communication advisors and analysts, we can actually tell people how to use metaphors in their design of texts, for instance, or in their design of business communication. What is also clear is that deliberate metaphor has various linguistic forms, and that's the metaphor in language dimension that cognitive linguists have pointed out, as well as various conceptual structures, that's the metaphor in thought dimension that cognitive linguists have pointed out, but that's not the whole story. Deliberate metaphor is a matter of a third dimension, and that is metaphor as a metaphor in communication between language users. It actually, the, ling the linguistic forms could be anything, the conceptual structures could be anything. The point is, it works as a metaphor between the person who sends the message and who receives the message, and that needs to come across, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, so this is a third dimension which cognitive linguistics has ignored. It makes people really understand one thing in terms of something else by online attention to that something else. You are actually thinking about the tunnel, about the symphony, about Shakespeare, the summer's day, about, in the doctor's case, a dance, or actually going to that domain, setting it up as a domain of reference, and using that to think about the target domain as a separate domain of reference. Okay, so that to me is very different than what is happening in most methods. So, I have a three-dimensional model. It extends the two-dimensional model of conceptual metaphor theory. It's not just language and thought, but also communication. And so, I claim that metaphor is always a matter of language, thought, and communication. Even if it's not deliberate, then that is its feature for communication. Okay, then the metaphor changes its communicative status. And I think there's nothing special about such a three-dimensional model because it follows from properties of each language use event that we can observe, whether it's about writing or speaking. And these seem to have been ignored in conceptual metaphor theory. So all of this led to the following map of the field that I have. Um, is it on the right? Yes. So what we have at the top is my level of discourse, which is, and just to sort of keep it simple at the moment, which is about the over here, the production, over here, the production, and over here, the reception of text in code in context. Any sort of discourse event involves the production of text in code in context and the reception of a text in code in context. And apart from that, or not apart from that, but maybe even part of that, and at the lower level, is the language use, where we have the production of an utterance, the utterance itself. The reception of the utterance and all of this together, utterance exchange. This would be the language dimension. These are the examples that we saw at the beginning of the talk, all of the little sentences. This would be the production process of those utterances. This would be the reception process of those utterances. And when we look at whether the, where the sender succeeds in getting the message across any other way around, the receiver succeeds in understanding what the sender meant, we're talking about utterance exchange. So this would be language, this would be thought, and this would be communication. Okay, and I think this goes for any aspect of any utterance that we look at. All of the papers that we've seen at this conference can be analyzed in this way. At the lower level of utterance, production, reception, and exchange, which is language use, and at the higher level of how these utterances work in discourse. In other words, how they build text in code in context. This is to me the orientation that I would like to use and develop in the next uh, minutes. So deliberate metaphor theory claims that metaphor is always a matter, a matter of language thought and communication simply because it's always a matter of language use. When metaphor is, metaphor is deliberate, it has a different role in communication than when it is non-deliberate. Because when it is delivered, what you have is a genuine change of perspective during discourse process. 
You're talking about diseases, and all of a sudden you're thinking about a dance or a fight. You're talking to your lover, and all of a sudden you think about the sun today. You're talking about life, and all of a sudden you leave it, and you're thinking about a tunnel or a symphony. Okay, that's the change of perspective. You go there with your attention, and you project back onto the target domain. And that is what is happening in deliberate metaphors, but it is not in non-deliberate metaphors, with all of the examples we had at the beginning. So when we have non-deliberate metaphors, yes, there's metaphor in the language, yes, there's metaphor in the conceptual structures, but no, there's no metaphor in the communication. You don't shift the perspective. Now, this is what is controversial. This is what people like Ray Gates hate when I say this. Okay, so we'll see what that, um, how we can talk about that maybe later. Given what we were talking about yesterday, I've added this slide to make connections with um, some of the other pre uh, presentations. All of this has to do with intentions, because clearly deliberateness is intentional. It's a different word for intention. It has to do with attention, so people paying attention to the source domain is a separate reference, or not. It has to do with awareness. When you pay attention, you can be aware of what is in your mind. And it even has to do with consciousness, because you can become conscious of the fact that you are aware of something. Okay? These are very uh, difficult terms in cognitive psychology. We're uh, working on that at the moment. All of this is cognitive processes. Um, and so um, we can relate this to discourse psychology uh, as long as we remember that we're talking about the, the production and the reception of the utterance in terms of the ongoing discourse event. And Milton's talk yesterday can be connected to this. There's somebody in intercultural pragmatics called Islam Hedges um, who um, finds this work interesting. So that is um, another way of making connections with this conference. What I should also emphasize is that there's a big distinction here between individual and social processes. The individual processes are what is going on in your mind, and the social processes is what is going on between all of us here right now together. This can explain how we can have variation and how we can have change um, and how we can relate to cognition and embodiment. This goes inside most of us in terms of you know what, what do these terms trigger in terms of our brain and how does that relate to our bodies. But I have another uh, controversial idea here. I don't believe that the primary metaphors that are distinguished in cognitive linguistics really are primary metaphors. I think they are metonymous. And so, for instance, it, um, intimacy is warmth. They come from, the, and the, the example there is a baby held by the mother. Intimacy and warmth go together. They are not like each other, but they go together. So all of these examples of the primary metaphors, I think, can be reconstructed as autonomies, and that's a very different process in Mac. So there's a couple of serious fundamental issues here that are brought up by looking at metaphor in this way. Okay. Um, so we've talked in the first two parts of the talk about metaphor in language, so the bottom part of the picture. Okay, we're talking about utterances. Now I'm going to try and make the connection with discourse. And I do that from the perspective of genre. And you saw the word genre in that picture there. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Metaphor, so metaphor is not just a stylistic device or a matter of style, as we saw at the beginning. I think it's also not just a matter of language use. I think it's more than that. I, I think it's also a matter of discourse, as long as you remember what it does in language use. And so now I can um, proceed to this little bit here, what is happening when we produce a text in a code in a context, the thing I'm doing right now is a genre event. It's not just discourse, but it's a genre event. So you all know that you're listening now to me producing this talk as a lecture, as a plenary. On the reception side, you are also producing a text in a code in a context in your mind because you've activated your model, your mental model, on a plenary at the conference. That makes it possible for you to understand what I'm saying, to remember it, to store it in a particular way. So we're not just talking about discourse in a general sense, we're talking about just discourse as a genre event. And I think that that is something that we need to understand as well. This is basically a cognitive schema or a cognitive script that we're using, which is much, much more different than the language use that we're looking at at the bottom, which is 
you know, you do this automatically, you're hardly aware of what you're doing from one sentence to the next. But you are working hard and maybe even thinking right now, what the hell is he talking about? How can I keep my text coherent? Or how can I keep my role as a, as a listener um, active? Or I'm so tired because last night I was singing in the bar until half past one. You know, that kind of thing. So, um, there's a lot more happening than just text encoding context here. For each of those uh, little areas, um, we need to um, distinguish a couple of variables that have been very, very important in all discourse analysis. So, for instance, for text, we need to distinguish that texts have a particular content, they have a particular type. For instance, they can be argumentative, they can be in an exposition, they can be a narrative. They have a particular form, like newspaper articles or research articles. And they have a particular structure, as has been studied, for instance, by rhetorical structure theorists. These texts are produced and received by participants with particular roles, with particular identities, with particular relationships, expertises, goals, and so on, in particular domains. So science is very different than literature, is very different than the law. In different <laughs> settings, this room is very different than what I have in Amsterdam, for instance, or than the bar that we were in yesterday. Um, different mediums, like if I don't have the PowerPoint, I could not tell this story at all. Or I, I could, but it would be much, much harder. Okay? And then we have aspects of code, and that's what we're going to focus on in the rest of the talk. So, for any genre event, we have knowledge of the language that um, we're, putting, we're um, interacting in, the register, the style, and the rhetoric. And it's interesting that there are, that there's hardly any native speakers here, of course, so we're all interacting here in a language that is not our own. And that is, of course, due to the fact that we're in the academy. It places kinds of restrictions on how the register works, how the style works, and so on. So, um, there's loads of examples of genre analysis, like the plenary lecture, like the bar talk, like your dinner conversation, like reading a newspaper, uh, going to a film and watching a film, all of those are genre events. We distinguish them from each other, and they have slightly different settings for the discourse event that you're in. There's questions about how many genres there are, how many variables for each. I mean, I've now listed 12 variables. I mean, are there 12? Are there 11? Are there 13? <coughs> are there 13? What are their relations? Have I got that right? This is just the beginning, I think, of a big research program. And what are the categories per variable? So, for instance, text types. I go with work that has been done in the 70s and 80s, where people make a distinction between argumentation, narrative, exposition, and description. Are there only four? What's the model that underlies those four? And so on. And so, for this conference, how many styles are there? What would be a good repertoire of, or set of style labels that we can distinguish? My claim is that just as with the metaphor stuff, I think for genres, we have a genre repertoire in our minds. As we grow up, we acquire genre knowledge and we learn how to make distinctions between all of these different events and how to behave in those different events. And I think Milton's uh, example yesterday of how you behave in a particular genre event, or you didn't distinguish between the genre event, but I think the genre event actually plays a role there if in formal communication you do the staring, it works differently than if in private communication you do this. So all of that um, would play a role there as well. What I would like to do is construct genre profiles. So a newspaper article, you could describe it, for instance, for who are the participants, what's the domain, what's the setting, what's the medium in terms of the text, what's the content, the type, the structure, the form, in terms of the call, what's the language, the register, the style, the rhetoric. And you could do this for each of the genres that you can distinguish, and that would drive the use of metaphor in them, and it would account for the use of metaphor. And this is like the big picture that I'm trying to develop. And so there's issues as well about genre acquisition, genre variation, genre transformation, change. It's not as if there's only one, of course, form that is unchangeable, um, when we talk about discourse, on the contrary, I mean, what is happening at the moment on the internet is that there's lots and lots of genre change happening and genre experimentation happening, and we're basically living in a live laboratory almost of 
what is happening with uh, genre use. So um, what I'm interested in for this talk is basically what's the relation between text by genre, what's the relation between context by genre and code by genre at the level of language use. So the top and the bottom of the picture. And then in, in the metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, included at the bottom. And so let's focus on um, metaphor and style. Metaphor and style, then, is the relation between one variable here, style, and one little phenomenon here. Okay, so this is what I'd like to describe and see how we can um, say something sensible about that. But maybe, in order to do so, we also need to be aware that there's metaphor and register here as well, and metaphor and rhetoric here as well. Can we distinguish that? Can we see how metaphors over here are influenced by our expectations of the register, their style, and the rhetoric of a particular producer? So, are any patterns or um, incidences of metaphors down here in language use relatable to what we expect of the genre event in terms of register, style, and rhetoric? I think that that's the the ambitious model that we should try to uh, develop. And so um, that is what I've just explained with reference to the picture. And my assumption here is, and I don't do that uh, on my own account, metaphor in style is basically personal variation within metaphor in register. Certainly if we, for instance, talk about this lecture, my metaphor of style, if somebody were to analyze it, would be shown to be my style against the register of an academic lecture, where we would have general patterns of metaphor use. My notion of register is taken from Weiber and Conrad, simply because they, I think they have um, done the most encompassing work on what counts as a register and how you can analyze it. And so here's what they say uh, in their 2009 book, a register is a, is a variety associated with a particular situation of use, including particular communicative purposes. And so the particular situation of use, might, including particular communicative purposes, might simply be my genre. Right? Because I think a particular situation of use and a particular communicative purpose together almost define a genre. The description of a register covers three major components, the situational context, the linguistic features, and the functional relationships between the first two components. Um, and And so, um, while the handout is uh, being handed out, um, I can um, prepare you for what's coming. You see, you will see a table from Byron and Conrad, um, which is table 5.2, um, and it shows you the linguistic features of three different registers that they discuss in that book, newspaper language, academic prose, and conversations, and they list the typical features of each of those registers, um, and I'm going to concentrate in the rest of the talk on academic prose because I'm taking one case study um, of an academic book as my case for the rest of the talk. And so what they say is for academic prose that there's, and they, they, um, they divide the linguistic features into nominal features, verb characteristics, circumstance and variables of time and place, linking adverbials and other features. They say that um, academic prose has a lot of nouns, relatively speaking, a lot of nominalizations, a lot of prepositional phrases after nouns, in comparison with news and with conversation all the time. And this is, these are comparative uh, statements. Um, a lot of attributive adjectives, 
Analysis pre modifiers of analysis well are rarely personal pronouns. This is at the nominal level and in comparison with the other two registers. Again, this is something that people have known for a while, but they, uh, you, they do this in, um, in their textbook for illustrative purposes. Verb characteristics, um, they say that present tense is more common than in use and far more common than the past tense, and that the past tense is rare. For modals, they are uncommon. For passives, they are more common than in use. And so they make a number of comparative observations here that people will recognize uh, if they have done any work in this area of stylistics and register studies uh, before. And so let me go to my case study. This is the background against which I want to look at um, a book by Susan Greenfield, which is called A Day in the Life of the Brain, The Neuroscience of Consciousness from Dawn Till Dus Dusk. This is like a kind of a popular science book, um, but it's, it's pretty tough as a popular science book. Um, and it talks about consciousness um, from her perspective. And Susan Greenfield is one of the top uh, neuroscientists in the world at the moment. And every respectable neuroscientist has to have their own book on consciousness at the moment. So this is her take on that. And so to, first of all, establish how her academic prose uh, relates um, to the, the, the register characteristics that Fiber listed is a little passage that illustrates her language use. Interconnectivity includes a vigorous interplay between the connections streaming to the brain from our sense organs. If we look at ourselves as primers in VAK term, terms, our brain processes are strongly visual, taking up approximately 30% of the cortex, compared with 8% devoted to touch and 3% to hearing, and so on and so on. Okay, if we look at the nominal features, here are all the nominal features that uh, Biber and Conrad list. You get lots of nominalizations, you get lots of adjectives, you get lots of um, um, post-modifying um, prepositional groups, you get nouns um, pre-modifying the head of the noun phrase, and so on. If you look at the verbs, all of them are in the present tense, indeed. Okay, so this, this passage really illustrates the character, typical characteristics of academic prose. Now, the question, of course, is how does metaphor relate to this? Um, what we did in my group uh, um, since 2005 was basically take the Biber approach to register and use the registers that they talk about in their big grammar and annotate for metaphor in text excerpts. Um, from that course. So we constructed four samples, we collected four samples of 45,000 words from B and C baby, and we annotated them for metaphor by means of MIPVU, which is our extension of MIP, which was talked about yesterday. The mean number of metaphors in um, all of these four samples is 13.6%. This means that one in eight words is metaphorical. This also means that seven and eight words are not metaphorical. Okay, and this is this was a new finding. We didn't people may know about this. This was something we didn't have in 2005, and we now have this corpus. It's available publicly from um, this site, the Metaphor Lab site. And you can go to um, a tab called Resources, and you can download it. And even do searches in it. What is even more interesting is that the four samples were in a very clear rank order. So academic was most metaphorical. News followed, fiction was third, and conversation was last. And academic was more than twice as metaphorical than conversation. Okay, so why is this? Well, clearly, if you look at a uh, language like Greenfields, it's about abstract topics all the time. And so we need a lot of metaphor to talk about those abstract topics. So to give you an example, from the same text that I just showed, all of the red words would be metaphorical by our method and by Lake from Johnson's method. So vigorous interplay, connections would be metaphorical, streaming into the brain, metaphorical. If we look at ourselves, metaphorical terms, no, but talk about concept, uh, concepts, take up approximately 30%, devote to, to hearing what we do with incoming visual information, construct spatial maps. As you can see, a lot of metaphor there, according to conceptual metaphor theory. Okay, but hardly any of this, of course, is deliberately metaphor. 
use of two, for instance, unlike all prepositions, is clearly not deliberately metaphorical. So what you see here is a lot of metaphor, which is also expected from the general register perspective. If we now then ask whether this is stylistically idiosyncratic, we first need to define style. Uh, Weimer and Conrad say the style perspective is similar to the register perspective in that it considers the typical linguistic features associated with a collection of text samples from a variety. The two perspectives differ in their interpretation, that is, in the underlying reasons for the observed linguistic patterns. The systematic linguistic patterns associated with the register perspective exist because linguistic variation is functional. It's related to the situation, it's related to the purpose, and so on. Linguistic features are used frequently in a register when they are required by the situational characteristics of the register. But again, this is kind of a, a generally assumed starting point. In contrast, the linguistic patterns associated with styles are not functional. Rather, these are features associated with aesthetic preferences, influenced by the attitude of the speaker or the writer of, about language. That is, a speaker or author often has attitudes about what constitutes good style resulting in manipulation of language for aesthetic purposes. So going back to my big picture, yes, in your mental picture of what of the genre event, you also have some notions of style. Okay? And that and they may be related to register, but they are more personal. I think that to say that they are not functional might be a little um, too much. Uh, people like Richard Short would probably say something else there. And I'm also not really sure whether manipulation is the right word there because it suggests something that is more rhetoric than style, I think, but okay, let's take that for granted. So the question for style and metaphor in Greenfield would be, how does Greenfield differ from the patterns of register and metaphor in academic register? So we basically have to do a quantitative comparison between the big register and just this book, and then we got a, a, a statement about metaphor and style in Greenfield. So basically, we would have to check whether Greenfield has different patterns of word class by metaphor than in the complete register of academic. And if you turn around your handout on the other side, there's another table that also happens to be table 5 too, but it's from a very different publication. It's from a PhD thesis by one of my students, Veronika Hermann. And as you can see, we have a table there that gives you the rows for eight groups of word classes. The last one is remainder. So the seven are um, adjective, adverb, conjunction, determiners, nouns, prepositions, and verbs. And what you can see is the percentage of those in the academic register that are metaphorical. So 17.6% of the adjectives are metaphorical. In comparison with 21 in use, in comparison with, for instance, 13.3 in conversations. Okay, so academic adjectives work in a highly specific way when they are used at part. If you go to nouns, for instance, you see that 17.6% are metaphorical, which is the highest of the row. Compare that to what is happening in conversations, that is less than half, okay, 8.3. So you can see that there are patterns here of combinations between word class and register and metaphor. It's a three-way interaction. And these are general patterns um, reconstructed across the four registers. And now we would have to insert Greenfield, as it were, and do the counting there. And then we would see whether maybe she uses more nouns metaphorically or more verbs metaphorically than is common in the academic register. Okay, that would be, to me, uh, the way to do this stylistic analysis of Greenfield for metaphor um, in comparison with register um, and um, yes, in comparison with register. Okay, um, I'm going to speed up a bit because I do not want to um, miss the last part. So the conclusion to metaphor and style is metaphor and style is a personal variation against metaphor and register. Metaphor and register is functional variation of linguistic features and metaphor and register and style interact with variable word class distributions across registers. Okay, so all of this needs to be taken on board if you want to talk about metaphor and style and one little work. 
and that requires analysis of large-scale quantitative data collected by means of reliable annotation. So we need to apply things like MIP or MIP2 in order to know what we're talking about. Otherwise, we just get stuck in small case studies, which is fine, but I think we can actually move on. Now, just to give you a very quick flavor of how this works for deliberate metaphor, I'm going to skip the theoretical part because I guess that that should be relatively clear by now. So what we did with our VU um, Amsterdam Metaphor Corpus was um, we had a project uh, by Gudrun Renius, which was defended last week at the University of Amsterdam, which was all about the distinction between deliberate and non-deliberate metaphor. So in the corpus we had 200,000 words divided over four registers. Each of the registers was marked up for all metaphor. That was 13.6%. That means that that was about 25,000 words. And for each of the 25,000 words, Gudrun then decided whether they were part of a deliberately used metaphor or not. And this was her PhD project. It, it had lots and lots of different aspects. And now we have figures for the corpus in terms of deliberateness as well. So for each metaphor-related word, we need to check if part of the source domain um, if it is part of a source domain that functions as a distinct reference in the utterance, that was the question. And so, for instance, in the Greenfield example that we just saw, we saw that there was one little sentence there where she was constructing maps, and the maps was in inverted commas, and that signaled that it was deliberate. She was aware that the word, that the word map didn't apply, apply literally, but it was kind of a figurative map, so that was deliberately used. And we used, we constructed a new method, which is called Deliberate Metaphor Identification Procedure, or DMIF, which is now in press. And so, um, what we couldn't find, if academic has the highest proportion of um, metaphor-related words across the four registers, which I talked about before, it actually has the lowest proportion of deliberate metaphors across the four registers, together with conversations, which, have, which in fact has the lowest proportion of all metaphors. So we have very distinct patterns here. Scientists or academics don't use metaphor deliberately a lot. News, by contrast, has the highest number of deliberate metaphors. You know, all of those headlines, all of those funny, witty parts, that's good. We can understand that. And fiction is in between, and that might actually be the most surprising uh, finding, because most people would think that fiction is deliberately metaphorical, much more than any other register. Also, most deliberate um, metaphors are nouns and adjectives in uh, the corpus, which contrasts with most of the generally non-deliberate metaphors, which typically are prepositions and verbs. So we, when we do metaphor deliberately, we do it often via nouns or nouns in combinations with adjectives. Okay, so just a brief illustration of that and then I'm done. Um, Greenfield has a large number of deliberate metaphors, impressionistically, I didn't do the, the precise quantitative analysis, and that was even commented on in the section of her book. And I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples from, the, uh, from that. And this is partly due to her aim of popularization. She needs to explain stuff. And this is partly due to the complex and difficult, elusive topic of brain research about neuronal assemblies of cells. So here are a couple of quotes. Assemblies can be thought of, and this is neuronal assemblies in the brain, can be thought of as being a bit like the ripples generated by a stone thrown into a puddle. Once triggered, large numbers, millions, of neurons generate a spread of activity working together over a sub-second time frame. Okay, so the comparison with the ripples generated by a stone thrown into a puddle, that's clearly costly. Okay, and we go to that domain in order to understand the target. That's metaphorical. Think of degrees of consciousness as being a bit like the ripples emanating from the stone of a bit of the throw of a stone into a puddle. Imagine throwing your stone, albeit into a puddle that's already made choppy by the prevailing breeze. Despite this, your stone generates clearly distinct patterns of ripples. The stone itself is permanent or quasi-permanent. In any case, a definite and fixed object. Are you thinking of a stone or about the pore of the brain? You're supposed to be making the connections with the brain, but it's hard work, huh? because you first you, you 
get the sentences, you have to stop. And you need to do the projecting and the understanding yourself. It's relatively small, but the ripples that it now evokes are disproportionately very large. The stone is quasi permanent, but the ripples are highly transient. This whole text is about the stone in the pond. Right? And it's hard work for you to construct the image about the brain in a way that you know is correct, even. So I think that this is a very nice example of how metaphor is used deliberately to talk about something else without even talking about that other thing. Most importantly, there's the stone itself, as well as the external force with which it will be thrown, namely the strength of psychophysical stimulation. Ah, here's the type of domain. There's the variability in size, which we could view as the extent of an internal pre-existing hardwired network that is initially activated. Here's the brain again. So now we're going back and forth between the stone and the brain. And again, you have to work very hard to make those connections and work out what the text is about. There's almost 100 uses of the word stone throughout a 200 page book. Okay, and you can see, you can predict, of course, that at the beginning you get these extended analogies, and as she goes on, she can sort of assume that you get the analogy, and then the references to the stone become different. So in the middle she writes, let's now revisit the various parameters that will determine this final estimate for depth of consciousness. Dash, the extent of the ripples when a stone is thrown. Okay, we could, now we go from brain to stone. And the stone is post-modifying and explaining in retrospect how the statement about the brain in itself is supposed to be understood. This metaphor, so it's not even labeled as a metaphor, will be useful as we go along, as we can use it to unpack internal of that. Whichever chemicals happen to be available at the time will then sensitize or modulate the response of the surrounding cells to the activated, hard, activated hardwired hub, the stone into participating in an assembly. Okay, so as the book moves on, the style changes from very explicit extended analogies to more and more condensed references to the analogy, and you start thinking less and less about the stone and more and more about the brain. Nonetheless, it's just such localized and enduring connectivity that would fit the bill as a stone of varying size, just as its activation by incoming stimuli, say the sound of an alarm clock, would fit the bill for activating it. Whichever chemicals happen to be available at the time will then sensitize or modulate the response of the surrounding cells to that activated hardwired hub, stone, <clears throat> into participating in an assembly, creating ripples. Okay, so I think you get the, the gist of this Take a scenario where the stone is relatively small in size. As with an alarm clock, the raw sensory stimulation would have to be sufficient to recruit an assembly, albeit a relatively small one. Okay, so I think that this is a beautiful illustration of how a, a metaphor is used deliberately, is used very deliberately and explicitly and systematically at the beginning, teaches you how to think about something, and from page to page, from chapter to chapter, you're supposed to have internalized that model. You actually create a cross domain mapping during the reading of the book, you conventionalize it, and at the end, when you see stone, you think, oh. okay. Um, I think this is the last one. And just as inactivity, a lack of interaction with the outside world, a lack of stones being thrown, is a sign of depression, so depression can result from inactivity in this case. This is, I think, a nice example of not a stylistic analysis, but a rhetorical analysis. This clearly is a rhetorically, a rhetorical manipulation of the language, which, you know, if you see it's part of stylistics or not, we can talk about that, but um, it clearly is a very different phenomenon than the phenomenon we talked about before when we looked at that metaphorical words in general in the register and personal style. So rhetoric and metaphor is about functional variation of metaphor use for attention against the background of automatic patterns in register and style of all metaphor use. Academic English does not have a lot of deliberate metaphor, which is shown in that PhD study, which you can download from the metaphor lab site. All of the PhDs are available there as PDF files. Greenfield has a lot of metaphor, but this is not necessarily her personal style. You know, we would have to check. 
but it may just be the rhetoric required for this book with this topic, brain and neuronal assemblies, and the audience, the purpose and the popularization. It might just be this book, we would have to compare other books. Conclusion, um, when we talk about metaphor and style from the perspective of deliberate metaphor theory, there's a couple of things that I would like to, to, you to take home. Metaphor is language use in three dimensions. Style is a mental model or a representation of the code in discourse. It needs to be differentiated from register and rhetoric and from aspects of text and context. The case study shows that um, you can actually do this work in, in pretty systematic ways um, where we can make a distinction between style and register and rhetoric. Deliberateness has various functions. It can even lead to conventionalization in one text, but it doesn't make it less deliberate. And it can create particular effects in the reader and even resistance to this particular use of this particular metaphorical model in the reviewers of the book, for instance. And so why um, does metaphor and style from a deliberate metaphor theory perspective, um, why does that pertain to the interaction between language use and discourse? Because we're talking about the interaction between utterances, as we just saw in all of these little excerpts, and the construction of the text and code in context, which is the big book. Okay? We need a 3D model for metaphor and language use, and we need a 3D model for discourse with a submodel of style that can then hopefully account for all of these different aspects of metaphor. Thank you very much.